I'm Luca Giliberti, contributing writer for Gold Derby, and I'm joined today by Paul Walter Hauser, who plays suspected serial killer Larry Hall on Apple TV Plus's Blackbird. So, Paul, um, to kick things off, I would like to get your initial reaction to reading Larry's interrogation scenes in episode two, um, because they're essentially his big introduction on the show. You know, how did those scenes read on the page for the first time? And what was some of the information about Larry that you were able to glean from them straight away? Yeah, um, I when I read those scenes, I think it was kind of fun for me as an actor because I'm thinking, what do I want to, what what pieces of reality do I want to sort of um, portray or betray or both, as it were? And I think I think it's really fun to kind of pick your pitch and kind of pick your moments in that in that scene. Uh, I'm also I'm a huge fan of Greg Kinnear so it was really exciting to know that he's on the other end of the table Uh, as far as as far as what's going through my head and what I gleaned from those scenes it was very much the the sort of the sort of deception that's outward versus Mm self-deception I feel as though as the show goes on we start to see and understand some of the inner wiring of the self-deception. Mm-hmm. But early on, it is that kind of, I know why we're sitting down where it's not like we're all catching up. You think that I did these things and how am I going to portray myself um, in light of that? And and mind you, this, this guy, uh, spoiler free antidote or explanation. Yeah. I will say this guy had, sort of been through this before this wasn't the first time he had been interrogated or questioned in any manner mm-hmm. so i i think like someone who kind of gets away with certain behaviors maybe you do approach it almost arrogantly and and you treat it as if this is a low stakes uh i've been there done that moment and of course um these these people people i say people really it was that one investigator that played by Kinnear uh that really pricked the pin in the in the balloon for him Mm -hmm. and you know I've read that you're someone who does a lot of uh, people watching or behavioral watching uh to prepare for a role so talk a bit about you know some of the qualities and traits you recognized in Larry straight away or in the process of making this show uh that were on the page uh, that you were really able to latch onto and that helped you inhabit the character ultimately yeah, I for any actors who might end up watching this or something, uh, dude, do not underestimate people watching. Mm. Uh, not only is it just kind of entertaining, and hopefully you can do it in a low key manner where you don't look like a <laughs> creep, but um, but I think like, dude, the some of the best stuff that I've tried to do or that people have said they liked or something, it's. I'm ripping it from somebody I saw at the airport or some dude I stood next to at a urinal or Mm. literally Vincent D'Onofrio like to to play to play this character I I studied D'Onofrio in Full Metal Jacket there were just a couple of things I aped one of them is that kind of Kubrick stare right the famous long sort of soulless uh soul being sucked out stare and uh and that that remains very very helpful. As far as the page, there were those really cool moments where Lahane said Larry looks off. He's in his own world. He, mm-hmm. you know, there were some really brilliant uh, cues in there that were intentional. And then other things are are just me trying to inhabit and not be afraid of making choices. Like I, th- I th- there's a moment where I have a piece of bread in the mess hall, and I yeah. I, bite the middle out of it mm-hmm. and then stick my thumb through and kind of like I do some weird thing but really it's just like those things you don't you don't plan all that stuff some of it is if you're approaching it in a childlike manner where kids don't judge themselves while they're playing uh things can kind of derive from that it's almost like a a visual stream of consciousness you know what I mean yeah, and I guess the more you walk, you've walked around in a, a character's shoes, the more you sort of understand and do things uh, instinctually, right? Like with the bread. Hundred percent. I also, I also, 
you know, I think there's some weird uh, intellectual pressure on acting sometimes <laughs> where yeah. Meryl Streep's or the, you know, they're all like in their head, they're like, what is the internal struggle? Mm-hmm. What is the what is the secret I hold that I can't say while in care? Like, there's a lot of, I'm not saying it doesn't work. Obviously, Meryl Streep is a tremendous actor. I just mean, it can be over-intellectualized sometimes. And I think what if you're trying to keep it real and you're trying to dissolve and you're trying to make people think this is a real person, sometimes if you're in a scene where you're eating a steak sandwich, the scene is about the steak sandwich, if that's what the character is. Like, it's right. not always about... Mm-hmm my childhood trauma is going to portray how I do everything. It's like, that's not true. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, I I encourage a lot of actors to simplify it and and remember what is the truest truth in the scene, not in the overarching narrative. Um, Because you can get lost in trying to be really heady when, when some of this stuff is pretty caveman sometimes. Right. And, you know, you mentioned childhood trauma and, you know, I have to assume that having these scripted flashbacks uh, on the show and having another uh, actor, I believe Cade Trapiano is his name, play a a younger version of Larry. I have to assume that was helpful for you inhabiting the character as well, right? At least having the flashbacks on the page. Totally. Yeah. Cade Cade Trapiano is is a really terrific actor. He did a great job playing Mm -hmm. younger me. Uh, Really good casting absolutely the team's part i uh yeah when i read episode four i was just flabbergasted because i didn't i didn't have all of that context i had some of it oh okay i did not know to what extent and the idea of him uh sort of doing the devil's bidding Mm. and and being introduced to people in that manner forget just ooh, this makes me feel bad it's not like the temperature changing in the room where you bundle up and throw a blanket on this is something chemically uh uh, instinctually psychologically that ends up happening if you were introduced to human beings in that manner at that age so it was very you know you never want to judge a character when you're playing them to some degree because you really have to (laughs) inhabit or whatever uh and if you judge, there's going to be that reticence or that uh, uh, timidity, which I despise timidity. That's one of the worst things you can have as an actor, I think, mm. sometimes as a person. Um, but I, I really do think that episode four with those those flashbacks and that, oh. that backstory, it allowed me to really humanize him and say, whoa, he was a victim before he was a perpetrator, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's very uh, traumatizing to watch, uh, for sure. And, you know, in another interview, uh, you talked about how your research um, was only, that research only made up around 15% uh, of your preparation process, whereas the other 85% is, you know, mostly script work, which I found very interesting. But I'm actually interested in that 15% of research, you know, was that just stuff pertaining to the physicality, the mannerisms, uh, his voice? Or, you know, how did that bit of research add to or inform how you were going to play or approach Larry? Yeah, the, the it would be true to say that the bulk of the research is Dennis's amazing writing and then my weird stuff I bring to it creatively. Uh, but I found some audio of, of him. And, you know, the audio just when I heard his voice for those 10, 12 seconds, whatever it was, mm-hmm. He just sounded like a wounded animal. But the thing about wounded animals is sometimes they play dead. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. And I, I really do think he was kind of playing dead. But as they say in the world of professional wrestling, uh, they call it playing possum. <laughs> You're lying down just to uh, just to try to portray yourself as as being out of function and then of course you can either snap back and and get someone in your clasp or you can be you can have your sentence reduced or you can be let go or whatever he was after clearly he thought that there was going to be a way out of a life sentence in prison and he had to uphold some sort of uh facade you know mm-hmm. that that was my biggest takeaway from the from the uh research that 15 percent 
Right. I think it's very interesting because you've also talked about how there was very, there's not that much about him out there. And there's only, I think, like 10 to 20 seconds of audio that you were able to um, access or look at before preparing for the role. So that's uh, crazy. Yeah, there wasn't much. You got to get creative. And uh, and I really, I enjoyed the process of creativity. Living in his skin sucks, obviously. It's not something I enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. Just like when I played a racist piece of crap in Black Klansman. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, it's not fun doing that. But uh, it is satisfying to know that you're making a Spike Lee or a Dennis Lehane happy when <laughs> they, all, they all cut. And it's like, you you know, you you hit that thing. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i can imagine and yeah. you know you, you've talked at great length about how you perfected that high-pitched uh, breathy voice but i'm actually more interested in the inconsistency of it because you know there are definitely scenes uh, in which you drop your register uh, vocally so why did you make that decision and would you say that larry himself does that intentionally yeah i mean listen i could try to i could try to portray myself as being a really awesome cool actor who doesn't make mistakes the the out of fear i would lie to you but out of love because i love y'all i'm going to tell you the truth the first two episodes that is way more honest mm -hmm. to what his real voice was and in all the in all of the confusion of playing the character and what i was going through in my own personal life while filming mm -hmm. yeah i just lost it i just sometimes you lose it and in episode two to three, there was a transition where it started to get mu noticeably higher. Mm -hmm. And I kind of asked Dennis, I was like, do you feel like I'm, and he almost cutting me off was like, yeah, we've watched some footage. It kind of, <laughs> I was like, oh God. <laughs> then he looked at me and he's like, but you know, Larry, when he's lying, exactly. when he has to put on a different sort of character for prison, he probably, the real voice is more like episode one and two. And when he says something that he feels comfortable with, the voice can drop a little bit. And I was like, I looked at him like, dude, you just bailed me out. Entirely. <laughs> so I ran with that from episode four through six, where uh, I was cognizant of let's, let's let it live in this fairy land. And then let's kind of bring it down to the depths of hell when he's in, in five and six, when he's talking to uh, Jimmy Keen. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes absolute sense. I mean, we don't speak in a straight line in real life. I mean, our voices change depending on who we talk to, who we're talking to, or depending on the situation we're in. So I think that makes it, a lot of sense. And it's kind of embarrassing. I've realized that about myself, that I change voice mm -hmm. five times a day. Yeah. And it's usually like, oh, this person, I deem this person to be very pure. I'm unconsciously going to try to act more polite around them. Oh, I deem this person to be rough around the edges. I'm literally going to insert curse words on, <laughs> like to like make myself feel more like someone I think they want to have reflected. I it's it's psychotic how 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 many things we do in that regard. Um, and obviously, Larry was a little more strategic in that in that sense. Yeah, that's, I think that's really fascinating. And, you know, what comes ha hand in hand with Larry's voice and making him, in my opinion, such a mystifying, enigmatic character for, uh, or person for most of the show is that, you know, sometimes when he's talking, it's not like he's really there. It's almost like he's detached, ment uh, mentally detached. And you've said that what you were doing in, in many scenes is something called selfish or gainful disposition. So could you elaborate on that a bit? Well, wow, selfish or gainful disposition. Yeah, I mean, it's, I would have to know the surrounding context to give you some exactitude on that phrasing. But mm -hmm. what, what I think I was getting at, assumedly, was this idea of the character is, some people are in their own world because they're like weird. Other people are in their own world because they're like, I own the world. Mm -hmm. Um so the first example is some kid who is who loves manga and doesn't identify with other kids from his school and is sort of just like in his own world to keep occupied to not have to face the fact that there's no uh, link to the surroundings. Mm -hmm. the, what I was doing was more like what a popular kid would do, where it's like, I have this rarefied air, I have my own ideology, and I'm going to live by that 
promulgated code as if it is my DNA. And that's, that's more what Larry's doing. Uh, gainful disposition, you know, there's not to bring it back to wrestling. Cause this is just so, you know, uh, it's so silly, but I, I love it really. It's helped me as an actor in a lot of ways, uh, watching it, but there, there is, there are sometimes these wrestlers who will, who will, people will think they are great because of their surroundings. So they, they don't, they're not actually great themselves, but you were in this tag team with this other brilliant performer, or you were part of this group that had this really big match at WrestleMania or whatever. And suddenly the legend builds. And I think, I think, you know, that that's, that can be a form of dishonesty as someone goes, if it's happenstantial, whatever, but it can also be a strategy. And, and I think that's some of the trickery that goes on in Larry's mind of like, I'm believing the myth. I'm growing the myth. I feel I'm at this level. I'm not. And that, that, uh, that self-deception then takes the form of sort of an unearned, uh, dangerous confidence. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting uh, explanation. Uh, thank you for that. I like the, uh, how you tied it to wrestling. Um, and before we slowly wrap things up, uh, we obviously have to talk about the relationship between Larry and Terry Edgerton's character, uh, James Keen, who I think, you know, it, it, in my opinion, represents a lot of the things that Larry desires, but is also in many ways, seemingly, you know, the friend he's never had. So how would you characterize that relationship from Larry's point of view, of course? I was sorry, as you were talking about Taryn's character, I started mm -hmm. just thinking about Taryn because I miss him. What was this? What was the second half of the question? Um, it, how you would just characterize that relationship, but you can also talk about uh, how it was working with Taryn. Yeah, I I think that uh, I mean, I mean there is something very magnetic about a person who is dissimilar from you taking interest in you. Now let's take it out of the vanity of he has muscles and a great jawline and blah, blah, blah. Let, let's just talk about, I'm talking Jimmy Keen, not Taryn. Taryn is, I mean, you can, you can't tell on camera, but that guy, I mean, he looks like, he looks like Dustin Diamond. He is not as <laughs> looking as you think. No, um, there, there's that thing of w when someone who is classically whatever is attracted to you, but there's also a thing where a guy like me who, who has some insecurity issues in real life, and kind of has a weird voice always telling him he's stupid. That that makes it so that if someone I deem to be very smart takes an interest in me, I'm like, maybe I'm maybe I'm not boring or stupid, or mm -hmm. maybe I'm great. Like there's that thing. So I think for Larry, there was something there that he had ignored that he thought, well. If this guy is still unrelentingly uh, friendly to me, maybe it's indicative of something about me. Maybe I am as great as I. So a lot of it is, once again, gainful disposition. It's selfish. It's ego. Um, and then that's assumed. What's on top of it is the idea of, oh, I have a friend. My brother's on the outside of prison. This is my brother inside of prison wow, maybe if we both get out, we would hang out outside. What would it be like to hang out outside of prison with this guy? Maybe I, and the and the breadcrumb goes on. But to abbreviate, I will say Taryn Edgerton is one of my favorite people I've ever worked with. Uh, we laughed together. We cried together. We, uh, we had some good days and some bad, but I think we both look at this like it's the height of our ability. We're both so proud of the show and, and what we accomplished. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And you played off of each other so well. And I just found that dynamic uh, throughout the entire show uh, really fascinating. And to anyone out there who hasn't watched it yet, uh, you absolutely should. And uh, yeah, congratulations, Paul, on the show again. And thank you so much for taking the time to speak about it with me today. It was uh, such a pleasure. That was really fun. Thanks for taking the time and thanks for watching the show.